All righty, test, test. Hello. Hello. Is this on? Hello, hello. Yeah. Great. Awesome. All right. Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. We are so excited to be here. I'm excited to be up here with both of you as well. I know we've been, this is a long time coming. We've been planning this for a while now. So super excited to be up here. This panel is Game Changer, XR Sports Training and Immersive Experiences. And I'm so excited just to be able to talk about the content we have in store today. Um, a little bit about me, my name is Veronica Yip. I do product marketing for our extended reality team at NVIDIA, and I, I love AWE. It's always a special time to be here with all of you and get to know um, other folks in the ecosystem. Before we get to these two over here, we're actually going to do a sizzle reel for all of you. So let's go ahead and turn our attention to this screen on this side. Hopefully we do a sizzle reel. Baby team. Can we go to the next slide? <laughs> <laughs> Awesome, really cool. Yeah, let's give it a round of applause. Great, all right, and then with that, let's go ahead and introduce our panelists here. So joining me today is Ruben Quadra, who leads the Emerging Technology and Devices Group at Verizon. And then we also have Jason Yim, the founder and CEO of Trigger XR. So maybe we start with you, Ruben. Would you like to introduce yourself? Sure, yeah, my name is Ruben Quadra, head of Emerging Technologies and Devices at Verizon. And uh, I've uh, joined Verizon a little more than a decade ago. Um, very focused on uh, launching cellular devices, wearables, smartphones in the consumer channel. And what has been very fascinating from this journey is pick a year, look at the user value or the user experience, and it was almost making the previous year obsolete. And um, that, that was fascinating, but now we are seeing there's a plateau of value. Um, there's, there's a limit of what you can do within the constraints of a smartphone and a flat screen. And this is what is uh, more fascinating and more interesting is that what can we do beyond that? How can we raise about the plateau? And how can we, we continue to increase the value and the user experience by going beyond the limitations of the device? So I'm talking about the AR and VR devices. For us, this duo of new devices, new devices interfaces, enabling or allowing to do more user value, more user, more user experience. That's what uh, is super interesting and I want to talk about this today. Awesome, looking forward to it. And then Jason, would you like to introduce yourself? Please, uh, yeah, so I'm Jason Yim, CEO of Trigger. Uh, we're the world's most experienced XR agency, 300,000 hours. Uh, our first AR project was 14 years ago, wow. ago so it's been a while. Um, but uh, we work with entertainment, uh, commerce, enterprise, and on the sports side, we do uh, we work with uh, a lot of the leagues. So NHL, uh, we're taking the PGA onto Roblox, a um, uh, uh, bunch of NFL teams, so on and so forth. The interesting thing about this is like a lot of it is um, uh, marketing driven, but what we're going to show you here today is around training. So um, and that's super fascinating because it's a it's a different area of sports and uh, the benefits are completely different and the challenges are completely different. But as, as a whole industry, um, the, the whole sports world is so geared towards kind of early adoption and trying to find this like, what's your incremental benefit? How do you get better at everything every day? So, um, so we'd love to share some of that today. Yeah. yeah, awesome. That sounds great. Alrighty, well, let's get into it. So we'll go ahead and start with the most obvious question, and this is for you, Ruben. Can you walk through the sports training POC that we saw a little bit um, in the sizzle reel and just kind of describe that for us? Yeah, through, through the uh, Verizon uh, partnership with the NFL, uh, we got a lot of access and a lot of talks with the NFL clubs teams. And uh, what was very interesting is that we saw that they started using VR to train their athletes. Mm. And um, concretely, the, uh, the area that was very interesting is, look, uh, I can teach you the play with a 2D piece of paper mm -hmm. uh, that is effective. If I do it in 3D, it's even more effective. But the feedback we got from the clubs and, and teams is, uh, can we actually push the use of VR 
beyond beyond just memorizing the play because you still need to go and do it and train. Right. And uh, basically, without saying the word, they were saying, can we do it in AR? Can I go to uh, the field, put some glasses, play against a virtual team? And that's basically the, uh, the POC. And uh, we had to do this because th this, these are very powerful experiences by, by the model of streaming from the edge uh, through the radio interface. And uh, it was very important for us not to add more weight. I think we, we heard a lot of uh, speakers today about hey, how, how do we reduce more weight mm -hmm. in the glasses. And what we did is all the radio interface, all the batteries, everything, we offloaded and put them on the, uh, uh, on the shoulder. Mm -hmm. So we, we created this concept of a neckband that has all the radio, connects to the glasses. We stream all the experience from the edge and, and this model is like super powerful. Awesome. Okay. And just to, just to touch on the experience a little yeah. bit, like basically what it does is allows the, the athlete uh, to learn special plays or different plays, and they can see it, and you saw in the video, you can see it like a tabletop view, so kind of a third person, you know, uh, understand it like spatially that way, or you can see it first person, you know, life size on a field. Um, and it's kind of like two different perspectives to learn those plays. And I do want to bring up that when we um, were first starting to work together, we brought in a subject matter expert that's actually a, a Victor, who's um, a, a college collegiate coach, a defensive coach um, for one of the uh, colleges in Hawaii, universities in Hawaii. And um, he not only did he bring in kind of the uh, individualized plays and, and all the nuances that we need to, for teaching, but he also kind of emphasized for us the, the whole purpose of it, right? Mm -hmm. Like we see sometimes training as a, oh great, it's, especially on sports, oh, it helps you get better at a game, you know? Um, but at the NFL level, uh, they can, these players can get cut in practice off of a, you know, in, at one single practice, uh, at, like uh, in preseason. Um, they, their performance on, on, you know, is measured by, you know, uh, inches uh, over, over, you know, uh, a game. And it can relate, it can turn into, you know, a million dollar bonus, two million dollar bonus, or the longevity of their career can adjust just based of how well they know this stuff. Um, so that's what he was, he was kind of emphasizing to us, that it's not just, hey, you're getting better at the sport for fun. This is your livelihood. And this is for the professionals and for the teams, you know, one, two percent difference in the game uh, it could be millions of dollars and could be, you know, uh, yeah. you know, lifetime notoriety, you right. know, making it to the Super Bowl. So um, that was a great perspective to, to take and apply into this. Yeah, that's a really good point. And I know you all are both talking about football, but there's other sports, right, that you've yeah. seen this be used for. Can you talk about those a little bit? Yeah, so some of the other examples in there were um, for, for the NHL, uh, we did a AR project where it's live telemetry, so it's real-time data, and you can actually replay it, uh, you know, in real time. You can, you know, watch the game live and see it tabletop rink and show all the players, tap on any player, see how fast they're going and stuff like that. And the really interesting thing was when we were showing that to the coaching teams, they were really excited because this is the, especially with hockey, it's so fast. Mm -hmm. No one's ever seen that information before. So that's the first time you could actually tell how fast people were going. Right. Uh, and you can actually start building a history of like, uh, what is the, yeah, what is the average skating time and how does it go down over, you know, are their shot speeds getting higher and all that sort of stuff. But um, the interesting thing on the coaching side was they were worried that the, the player unions would have issues because you actually don't want to show that much data, right? Mm -hmm. Like you're getting, like myself, we're getting a little bit older, we're moving a little bit slower. You don't actually want to have that all measurable up the whole time. Um, and then we have an example up there uh, for uh, PJ Junior. So it's a partnership with Niantic and it was teaching kids how to play golf. So it was actually, so different kind of training, more consumer facing, um, uh, but using entertainment and play to try to teach and in a multi-user uh, situation too. So uh, it makes it social, makes it easier to, and more fun to learn. Mm -hmm. um, and the final example that we put up there was actually the, the uh, Super Bowl um, experience. It was an AR portal into the Super Bowl. Uh, we just won a, a gold Clio for that one. Um, and just wanted to mention like the uh, consumer appetite in this space. Uh, that was uh, half a million simultaneous users in an AR portal at the same time. Wow. Um, and they stayed in the portal about 90% of the uh, halftime show uh, for the Super Bowl. So it wasn't just a gimmick that they checked out. They were really engaged and spent the time there. 
And we feel that sports is that industry that has that appetite from the consumer so yeah, that, for all this technology. That's amazing. That's really impressive. Yeah, I feel like, yeah, the world of sports is, is on the brink of changing for sure then. That's amazing. Um, all right, and then I think with that, so that's really good background. Thanks to both of you for background on sports and the POC. Uh, maybe we get a little bit into the tech here um, just a bit. So Ruben, I know, um, can you speak about Verizon's 5G network and how that was used in this project along with NVIDIA's CloudXR streaming? I'm biased towards that, of course, but um, just talk about how those were used in this project. And um, Sure, no, I know, I know that we've seen uh, an AR use case, but the collaboration with NVIDIA actually started in VR. Mm -hmm. uh, we in, in immersive entertainment. We have a customer, Dreamscape. Uh, if you guys have not seen the uh, VR movies, I recommend that you go there. You can touch dinosaurs, it's like, like amazing. And the way it works is it's using VR connected to a backpack mm -hmm. that's doing all the rendering. And the feedback that we got is, hey, we want to move this backpack because it's a 20 pound machine off uh, to the edge and um, not being restricted on the rendering capacity of the backpack. We tested it on Wi-Fi, it doesn't work. Verizon, please help us with some cellular. Mm -hmm. And this is where we started using uh, 5G. Uh, together with a great partnership with uh, Ericsson, we were able to do a lot of tweaking and fine tuning to the network and do a streaming uh, to hit the super high fidelity cinematic experiences that were required. Mm -hmm. Now, on top of that is the NVIDIA aspect of doing the rendering on the cloud and streaming this over 5G. Mm -hmm. There was a lot of uh, uh, work with NVIDIA that the majority of the streaming engines are optimized for Wi-Fi. Mm -hmm. And the correlation between bandwidth, latency, jitters that you see in Wi-Fi are very different compared to the ones mm -hmm that you see in 5G and mm -hmm. 5G. And these are, these are the changes that in fine tunings that we did together, NVIDIA, Ericsson, and us, uh, together with the uh, neighbor from Motorola. And I think the, uh, the, uh, the success was, was so good that we said, okay, well, then let's, let's play this and let's try to do this in AR, but in a public network. And this is when we uh, reached out to Jason Trigger and we did this, uh, this POC. Awesome, wow, amazing. Yeah, and thanks for your partnership in that. I know, um, we really appreciate you all partnering with, it, with us in that. Um, Jason, do you want to talk a little bit about how you see these sorts of immersive experiences evolving? Like, what's the next step? How do you see this kind of growing? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, you saw it in, 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 the, in the video where um, you see the life size on the field, I think. Um, and then at the beginning, we had those volumetrically captured uh, athletes. Um, uh, professional actually athletes teaching you their special moves mm -hmm. in person like we definitely think that a life size in the real world there's going to be some kind of measurable learning difference mm -hmm. and retention difference from that um, in the demo for the the current poc uh the the, the players are, are are more static mm -hmm. you know they're not kind of full animated they're not full physics and stuff but we think as the technology improves and, and, and with things like streaming, you know, uh, remote rendering improves, uh, that sort of capability is going to uh, open up a, a lot more uh, opportunities for us. Yeah. Um, and I think uh, AI is going to be big too, you know, looping that in. So it's like uh, right now we're kind of teaching one or two plays at a time. Mm -hmm. um, but if it's uh, dynamic and change every time, you know, understands where your level is and kind of keeps uh, uh, modifying based off of that, yeah. like then it becomes our actual, you know, super powerful, useful tool. But you also got to remember, like right now we're comparing this, even though this is like kind of POC level, the current way to learn these moves is a, uh, a file paper, like literally binders. It's been the same way for, I don't know, however many years. So uh, it's, it's a big leap for yeah, sure. Yeah, that's amazing. Wow, that's really exciting. Um, and of course, so we're talking about tech, all the tech that's involved in this, all the technology, right? Of course, we would have to talk about the challenges. So what challenges do you all see just kind of taking place with this technology? Anything you want to touch on? Uh, look, if you would have asked me last year, I would have <laughs> said um, streaming over 5G. Mm -hmm. That was a big challenge. I think uh, this last year we conquered that. And the next challenge is I think, I think we all know, have tested, uh, we, we all tested uh, AR glasses, mm -hmm. and um, I, sometimes after a minute, you're like, oh, I'm, I'm done, this is too heavy, this, this, this is too much. Mm -hmm. And um, I think lightweight glasses is still 
I would say, a, like a romantic um, vision that we all have as, a, as an industry, something that we can wear the all, all day. Uh, in, in Bryson, we have a program that's called All Day Wearability, mm. which is basically, now that we have these building blocks, now that we can stream very efficiently from the network, I can, I can reduce the load that I have on you device. Mm -hmm. So you can remove a lot of stuff and make it very, very lightweight. Uh, and we're doing a lot of testing in this, uh, in this program, of course, with Qualcomm Spaces. Um, very excited to bring a lot of value in that area. Mm -hmm. Anything like that, Jason? Yeah, I think for us, like uh, the interesting challenge is um, uh, we were chatting earlier uh, that this training use case is probably starting at the hardest possible training use case. You know, it's like we're not tra trying to teach someone how to like uh, attach a widget onto another widget. Like it's trying to teach NFL level football. You know, um, and when you bring it out into the field, uh, that idea of um, uh, now you're in an open space. Uh, there's all these other kind of hardware considerations, right? Like lightweight, of course, um, because you don't want to be, uh, especially if you're moving through the training, like if that's actually affecting your, I, I have to run a certain way so right. the glasses don't fall off my head, then it doesn't feel like real training, right? Um, I think uh, in the future, we also uh, con connecting multiple users together so they're learning the same thing at the same time. That's going to be a challenge as well. Um, and then just in this, particular scenario and sports scenario like safety mm. you know um, you trip you 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 get hit or something like that accidentally like how does that affect the glasses right okay yeah. that makes sense all righty and then last few questions here looking future looking um, for the future of XR and sports training um, Jason this one's for you and I know Ruben you touched on this a little bit too so feel free to jump in but do you think headsets will become a vital component of immersive sports, sports training you just talked on this but anything yeah. else you'd like to share yeah, I mean, I think like for me, it's like a, a well for us, like we we do, we do both mobile and and glasses. Mm -hmm. So I think that consumer journey is going to follow that path. Like you'll you'll start to learn more on your phone and be able to see volumetric stuff on your phone, and you just get used to consuming the information that way. And then at a certain point, when the glasses are light enough and uh, perform well enough, the content will just start shifting mm -hmm. uh, to that side. So I think it's. Uh, 100% it's in the future. It's, it's the question is how near future it, it's going to be. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. All right. And this brings us to our last question here. And it's always my favorite question, right? Because it's, it's a fun one. How do you envision the future of XR and sports training? Um, what do you see coming up next? Um, I know this is about the sports, but I think uh, the, um, the future is bigger than, than sports. Anything that's training, learning, development, you're starting to see many companies reporting the benefits of doing VR training, mm -hmm. like higher engagement, uh, higher retention rates, uh, as efficacy goes through the roof. Yeah. Uh, I mean, we've seen a lot of uh, these numbers these days here. And, um, and this, this has a dollar value for our customer because there's savings, there's better uh, business transformation. And we are seeing this also in Verizon. We were looking at the amount of uh, the units of AR, VR compared to the active users on XR training, mm -hmm. and that, that, that number is much bigger. That means that there's a demand. And this, this, are, this is a healthy situation. It means that like, hey, I mean, mm -hmm. if we have the right products, they will be consumed. So this is very, uh, very exciting for us. And the other trend that I think is very uh, relevant, and maybe this is one of the first apps that are showing this, is um, when you look at the uh, units usage VR versus AR, I think now it's like 70 to 30 percent, but you look at the uh, projections and it's going to reverse uh, through the years. It's going to be 30, 70. And when you look like, oh, wait a second, why, why are you saying that AR is going to pick up more than VR? And as and it's, it's always, you can see this, like this romantic view that AI is natural. Everybody wants this to be a success because mm -hmm. who doesn't want something natural? And uh, to, that, to that extent, the projects such as uh, the one that, that we are presenting today is, is, is helping uh, make that trend a reality. Yeah. Uh, I think um, one, one thing that's been really interesting is uh, we're, we're mentioning how many AWEs have we been to. Mm -hmm. uh, I think, I, I can't remember the first one for me, maybe it's like 10 or something like that, but like there was a, there was a time where um, uh, I think our, uh, as a creator or as a consumer's appetite 
was far exceeded the, the hardware capabilities. Mm -hmm. And I feel like it's starting to actually flip a little bit. Like the hardware now can, can do a, a lot of things, can deliver a lot of content. And where we're actually going to start uh, seeing bottlenecks now is actually um, just how a consumer controls the content. So right now, for training, every single player, we're going to have to teach them how to, how to interact with those glasses, right? The advantage of a binder is, you know, uh, you just hand them a binder, they know how to go through it. Um, uh, and it's universal that way. So uh, what we're hoping for is as more of these things come out on the sports side, they just become some kind of common language mm -hmm. that, that, the, that a consumer understands. So when they put on the glasses, they can, they can, there's a little bit to learn, but you can get halfway straight away in, into, the, into the training experience. So I think once that type of adoption and, and familiarity happens, mm -hmm. then you'll just see the benefits kind of skyrocket. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely agreed. Amazing. All righty. Well, that's all we have for you all today. Huge round of applause to our panelists. Oh, thank you so much. Appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. And I think with that, we have a few moments for questions. I see a mic set up right there. I think we have about three to four minutes. If anyone has any questions, feel free to approach the mic. Um, we'll just give you a few moments to ask anything of us. Um, hi, great talk. Um, so my company is working on a uh, peripheral that might have some sports training applications. And one of the things we found for sports training is there's basically two sides. There's the actual athletic performance, and then there's the sort of cognitive, neuroperformative side of sports. How, which have you guys tried to focus on, and how have you tried to maybe focus on those things or isolate those two things? Um, I think. The, the fundamental building block that we didn't have is being able to provide a, a, such a powerful user experience where I can go in the middle and, um, and interact and, and play with other uh, virtual teams, right? Um, we are used to say the word is spatial. This thing is spatial in the sense that I can, do, I can see spatial, but I also me, I'm, I'm, I'm interac interacting with the space. And, and, there was not much of that before because you had to incorporate the mobility aspect, which we did. What we, uh, I mean, now this is, this is working. I can tell you it was not trivial to um, improve the wearability. In this mm -hmm. case, we did a neck band. Um, some of the solutions they use a smartphone connected to a, um, through a cable, but I mean, the cables, you knock them off. It's, those things are not trivial. Mm -hmm. um, and now we have a second phase where we say, now that we have the building blocks, how do we make these two more onto a product? Mm -hmm. Now, for example, Verizon, we don't do NFL training. Others do NFL training for us to demonstrate that mm -hmm. when you use the power of uh, 5G Edge from Verizon, you can do very cool things. Okay. Actually, your, your question also brought up another benefit that, that our, subject, our, our subject matter expert brought to us, which was like um, the current training at, at the NFL and even at like uh, a collegiate level super regulated. You can only put your players on the field for so, so much time. Yeah. And then of course, uh, you know, uh, I'm playing my role. If I want to practice this one route X number of times, I have to get the whole team out there to practice mm -hmm. with me and what's mm -hmm. the cost of that? And they want to mm -hmm. practice other stuff. So using this technology can, uh, is just getting the reps in. It's mm -hmm. like the only and cheapest way to get that many reps for an individual for a particular play. Mm -hmm. And you can't do without this technology. So interesting. I'd love to pick your brain more offline because this is a <laughs> big problem that we face. So cool. Thank you. Awesome. Oh, there's a guys. Yeah. Oh, we have one more question. Okay, perfect. One more question. Uh, stepping a little bit away from the NFL specifically, have you experimented with the um, some of the devices that use XR to motivate and to drive fitness? I'm thinking like there's Holodia, there's Black Box. Uh, Icarus, Birdly, things like that, that have a fitness component, but they're highly gamified, and they can be coded to do very specific activities or broader fitness. Have you looked into those, or what's your thinking on the, the trajectory of those? I mean, uh, on our side, we know on the consumer side that the fitness uh, um, world is like so, uh, it's growing so fast, you know, not only uh, the capabilities of, of your devices to track your, your health and all that sort of stuff, but of course in, in VR and, and gaming and stuff, like uh, we haven't uh, actually applied, we haven't connected some of those peripheries to kind of our marketing campaigns yet. 
But I, I do see, yeah, it's something that we definitely want to explore how to connect those dots. Yeah. Great, thanks. Oh. Awesome. Thank you very much, guys. Another round of applause. All right.